thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to go through AUC and things like that in great detail because uh, you learn that better by experimenting with yourselves. Uh, and the only thing I can do that you can't do yourself is to make you fall asleep by going through all the details. So uh, here's an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'll say a little bit about the Python language. Uh, and then I will tell you about the atomic simulation environment and give you a few examples. And then I'll tell you how you actually use the, 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 the data bar system that we are having here. Um, and it would have been a good idea if I had written those instructions down on a sheet of paper and that had been included in your envelopes. So I didn't think of doing that until this morning. So instead, uh, those slides about the practicalities of logging on and so on, I actually printed out a lot of copies and placed over in the data bar room just inside the dots. Uh, uh, so, why Python? Well, Python is a language that we have chosen to, to, uh, to, to uh, be our main glue that glue the different codes together and the main tool, scripting language that we're using. And there are a number of, of, of uh, reasons for doing that. For those who are writing code, it's because it's a very uh, powerful object-oriented language that makes it easy to make modular code so that you can make have different people working on different blocks and then put them together and get it to work relatively easy. It's flexible. Uh, and it's actually relatively easy to write uh, readable code. There are some languages where uh, it requires a substantial effort to make code that anybody else can read. In Python, it requires some effort to make code that other people cannot read. Uh, and then there's a lot of libraries, numerics libraries, mathematics libraries, plotting libraries, etc. available. So we don't have to invent everything ourselves. For you as a user, the good thing about Python is that it's also a scripting language. So a scripting language is a language that is, uh, e that is uh, suitable for small scripts. Uh, a, a script is like, it's like in the the movie industry is telling something that's telling people what to do when. Um, and the simplest scripts that you can write are almost as input files would be to, 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 to other programs. Uh, it's also great for small programs and prototypes, but most importantly, it's easy to write. Um, so those of you who have never seen Python, before should not be too worried. You, you will learn the essentials within a few hours. Finally, it can be extended from in C or C or Fortran or whatever it is, and that's relatively easy and that solves the kind of the, the performance problems that you find in a, a, a scripted language like that. So typically if you do something numerically in intensive, the way to do it is to write a prototype in Python with the intentions of moving the inner loops over to C if the performance requires. And then you will typically find out that you don't even have to do that because you're calling some of these libraries to do matrix multiplications and everything. So, uh, but you have that possibility, and that is used quite heavily in, uh, in Hebrew. So if you're new to Python, the thing you should not do is rush out and buy a book about Python program. There are excellent books uh, out there, but it's a workflow. There's good online documentations. There's a good uh, Python doc, uh, tutorial at the Python website. Uh, there's a good reference manual over, out there also. Um, and if there's something you can't figure out how to do in Python, you just type Python and whatever you can figure out in Google, and there will be 27 pages explaining how to do it. You should be aware that Python is changing from the Python 2.x0 to Python 3.x0. And by now, the 3.x is what is recommended for production use, but we are still in the 2.x 
uh, work because that was what was available when we started developing all this code. We are in the process of fixing the differences are not that large. So we are in the process of fixing things so that ASE will become be, be able to run on the Python tree eventually. We're not quite there yet, but you will occasionally find weird places in the code where it's doing something slightly strange to be, be, be compatible with both versions. Uh, but um, just remember when you read documentation that and only if you download Python to install on your own computer, install Python 2. The way to learn Python and AAC and Python is uh, to learn a bike sample. And that's what we'll be doing at these computer exercises. And then finally, if you want to install it on your own computers, you can download it from python.org. Although I must say that our computer exercises here are with the, with the idea in mind that you don't run things on your own computer, that you log into our central computing system where everything is installed for you. That will save you a lot of trouble. So Python is like most other programming languages. Uh, there are a few things that are slightly different. Uh, for example, uh, blocks are marked by indentation <coughs> uh, instead of having braces or keywords or something like that. That's something that if you've never seen before, you think that's strange. This is a good thing that you can write in free format and so on. Well, it turns out that it's one of the things we end up liking about Python because the human mind sees the indentation and the computer, if that, if that sees some braces or something like that, you are bound to end in a situation where the two are different and then you have a bug that is very hard to find because you read one thing and the computer reads another thing. There was a really, really nasty example of that here earlier this year. Uh, there were a number of bugs that appeared in uh, one of the libraries used for secure communication over the internet. You probably some of you heard about the so-called heart bleed bug. But a month before that, there was a bug affecting all Apple systems, whether it's iPhones, iPads, or Macs, that basically rendered all the encryption um, well, trivial to bypass if you knew that the bug was there. And that was one that would be where the code looks reasonable, but the indentation said one thing, and the braces said something else. Uh, yeah, so that's a good example of, uh, and that code has been there for a year or so, so before something was done. Uh, another thing that's different is that loops are almost something that you can iterate over. That could be a list. So here you loop over the words apple, potato, tomato, and orange. Uh, so you're not limited to, to, to looping over numbers in a sequence. If you do want to loop over numbers in a sequence, then there's of course something for creating the sequence for you. Um, then one thing that really is different and that people sometimes get in trouble with is that the equal sign operator is not a variable assignment. It does not create a new variable and store a copy of the object there. It's giving the old variable a new name. So you can see that here, if you say, here you make A a list of these five numbers. Now B does not copy the list. Instead, B is just becomes a new name for the same list. So when you say A, element number two of A should be 42. Uh, this is element zero, this is element one, this is element two. Then when you print B, that has been changed too. That's something you need to be aware of. Now down here is an example where it doesn't happen. Because here you're saying C is 7 and D is C, and then you're modifying C. But this is really, you cannot change the number 7. Um, and what is really happening here is that you're creating a new object and giving it the name C. Uh, so you have to be aware of whether you're creating a new object or modifying an existing one. That's all I'm going to say about, I cannot give you a whole course in Python programming here, look at the examples and you will things, see things. But these are sort of the some things I thought was important to, to mention to make it easier to just get started. So the second part of my talk is about simulations. And I call it the anatomy of atomic scale computer simulation. 
Because instead of showing code, I'm going to show you what can you do, uh, or one of the objects and the parts that you need for computer simulation. I show you the code afterwards. <coughs> so the central part for an atomic scale computer simulation is the atoms. So in the atomic simulation environment, we have an atoms object. You already see me and John creating one uh, about an hour ago. The atoms object contains information about where are the atoms, what are their periodic, uh, uh, what are their atomic numbers, what are their velocities, etc., etc., etc. It also contains information about what is the whole system size, how big a system is it, and what are the boundary conditions. That you could have placed in a different object, or you could have, could have separated it out. We have chosen to, to, to keep it together. Um, then, if you're doing something with your, ad, uh, with your atoms, then you use what we call a dynamics. A dynamics object is something that can move the atoms. So it could be an object that does that uh, numerically solves Newton's second law, and that then you would be doing molecular dynamics. Or it could be an energy minimization algorithm that moves the atoms according to the forces until you find the local minimum of the energy. Uh, all of these things work in the same way. They ask the atoms, what are your positions, and what are the forces of all the atoms, and what is the total energy? Then since the forces are the derivatives of the energy, it uses that to move the atoms to a new position. Then it tells the atoms here are your new positions. Then it asks again, what are your forces and the energy in this? And so on, it continues to update the atoms. Now, the atoms know what its positions are, but what the energy is and what the forces are, that depends on a physical model for the interactions in the system. That is where density function comes in, theory comes comes in, and as you know, there are a lot of different approximations there, and you can even do something that is simpler than density function or theory, or more complicated. But in any case, what your dynamics need need is forces and energies. And since it's always the same thing you need, but you may need to run different programs to find it, to, to, to calculate it. The atoms still gave that calculation to a third object that we call the calculator. So you also saw how Jens Jörn was creating a depot object and then he said atoms.set calculator and, and, and then he placed that object in there. That really makes this connection here. So what happens here is uh, the dynamics says to the atoms, what are your positions? Okay, what are your forces? The atoms say to the calculator, my positions are this, what are my forces? This does a long or short calculation, returns the forces, and the forces come back there. This is all you need to run your calculation. Of course, if you actually want to know the result of your calculation, you should also store that somewhere. And that's where the last object comes in on this slide, namely, uh, an update for saving data in a file. Again, you may want to save something, another guy may want to save that something else. Um, so that is separated out in a separate object, and a few standard ones are provided for, for standard use. For example, we have what, what, what we call a trajectory. A trajectory would, we would do that every time this one is doing something to the, to the atoms, then it just tells the trajectory now we should actually save the atoms. It goes back and asks the atoms for the configuration and write it down. And that way you get, if you're doing molecular dynamics, you get a time series. And if you're doing energy minimization, you can follow the path down to the minimum. And in principle, you can replace that with another object that stores some other information. So this is a simple simulation. Now we have a lot of choice. Here's a more complicated figure showing the same thing. You will see the essence object here. I've shown here how you can choose between different kinds of, of, uh, of dynamics, molecular dynamics, energy minimization, or you can do more 
more elaborate things like the much elastic band algorithm for uh, calculating transition states. I think you'll hear about that in, in a talk later, later this week. Then you can attach one or more analysis things to your atoms. So I gave you an example of saving a file. You might also want to have something popping up on your screen, or you want to do some kind of analysis on the fly and write that down to a, with, a, with, a, with a marking that you have written yourself, for example, or calculate a rate distribution function, or something like that. And you can also add constraints to your atoms. So a constraint may be that some of the atoms are not allowed to move, or that a given bond length has to be fixed. And then that will, when, when the dynamics try to move the atoms, the constraint will, will enforce itself and it will also modify the forces so that it tries not to make the, 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 the dynamics not break the, the constraint. So all of this is part of the atomic simulation environment. The calculators here are then separate packages. You will probably mostly be using, or maybe only be using, the GPOL DFT code uh, during the summer school. But we do have interfaces to uh, a lot of popular DFT codes, and we also have interfaces to uh, more classical potentials. So, so uh, uh, classical potentials are much more approximate recipes for calculating the forces that can yet then be used for thousands or hundreds of thousands or even many, many millions of atoms. Uh, uh, but then under to more, a, a more or less split class of systems. So let me give an example of how such a Python script can look. So here is a molecular dynamics script, and let's go through it uh, slowly. The first thing is to import the modules that you need in your script. This one needs an awful lot of, uh, of modules. Um, actually, I think I've done things more complicated than absolutely necessary, but uh, that's how it goes when you reuse old examples. Uh, then, let me point out in particular this NuPy, import NuPy as NP. NuPy is a module for doing uh, numerical uh, recipes. And I should say, in case some of you are loading things frantically, all of this has already been uploaded on Campus Network where you can find the slides. Um, so this is a module for, for handling large arrays and so on. Uh, and since you get tired of uh, typing NuPy as all the time, we, we, we rename it as NP moving forward. I don't think it's used at all. So the first thing we do is creating the atoms. There are really many ways of doing that. We have, we have tools for setting up bulk calculations. We have tools for setting up surfaces and so on. And you can see them in the examples. Here I'm using one of the more uh, uh, low-level things of creating a block of FCC crystal. And then I take one of the atoms, so now this is a, a, an atoms object. So instead of specifying the atoms myself, I call a function that returns an atoms object. Now, here I take the first atom and I give it a momentum. Uh, and why did I choose those numbers? I think it's because it gives it a kinetic energy of 1.0 electron volts or something like that. Um, so now I take this atom and I'm giving it a kick. Then I prepare to do molecular dynamics, and since I want to do a long calculation quickly, instead of importing GPO, I'm importing a simpler interactions here. And then I set up a molecular dynamics code that should operate on the. So this is an algorithm, a standard algorithm for iterating Newton's second law. Uh, I have an object that does that, it operates on the atoms and it should know how big a time step it should use. So, so basically what it does is it uses the forces now to calculate the moments uh, 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 a little bit into the future, and then uses the momentum to update the positions, and then uses a new position to get new forces and calculate new moments, and etc. So and so on, and so on. And it is jumping fixed time steps into the future. In this case, I've used five frames of Then here, I 
attach. I want some output. I make a trajectory object for writing to this file, uh, and, write it, and, and this tells to write, and then I attach that, that to the dynamics object. So here you see the, the, the writer knows which essence it should write, and now I, what I do here is I tell the dynamics object, call this thing every, after every five time steps. Now, since this example was made, most of the dynamics you can also up here just write trajectory equal and then define name. And then it will do the same thing, except it will write for every time step. Uh, and then finally, I just tell the dynamics, I can do your magic 1,000 time steps. And we'll start doing time steps, and then with five times it will save in so far. So that's one example of running a script. Now my second example is a depot calculation. So this one was one doing something relatively complicated, maybe running molecular dynamics, but a simple description of the atoms. Now I want to use depot, but we want to uh, calculate something very simple, namely the atomization energy of hydrogen. So it's basically taking a hydrogen molecule and a hydrogen atom and calculate the energy difference. And it takes two slides here. So again, it imports the atoms and the atom object from ASE and it imports the depot calculator. And then it makes sense, well, I want this size of unit cell and I want the, the, the hydrogen atom placed in the middle. So I create one, I, I, I create an atoms object that only contains one atom. It's a hydrogen atom, it's placed in the middle of the cell. You have a magnetic moment of one, and the cell size is four by four by four. Then we put up a depot calculator here, and the arguments are that I tell it to use the grid spaced grid mode, the grid spacing that is slightly smaller than the default value, 0.18 Armstrong. I tell it's enough to use one band, which is a Yet, minimal maybe, but there's only one electron, so it should be okay. Uh, to use the Purdue, uh, the PV uh, exchange correlation potential, and write deep uh, uh, <coughs> it's logging to a file called H dot. I attach it to the atoms, and then I ask for the for the potential energy. And then this line here actually tells the calculator <coughs> depot to write all the, the, the information that it has into a special file. I'm not going to use it, but the, you may want to do that for analysis later on. Then you calculate the hydrogen molecule. So here's the bond length. Then now I put up two H atoms, and I give the two positions. Uh, so use the same cell. I change one of the parameters here, maybe the name of the text file. You can change most of the parameters if you want. Again, I attach the calculator to the molecule object. I ask for its energy, write the wave functions and stuff. And then finally, I write what's the energy of the inner atom and the molecule. And then the atomization energy is two times the atom, uh, uh, atomic energy, because there are two atoms minus the molecule. So that's an example of how you do a simple calculation. Um, so I don't want to give you more examples here because it's much more useful than you sit with them just. 